Our text for our message for this week comes primarily from Zechariah chapter 11, sold out for 30 pieces of silver. And this chapter is a difficult chapter. I read through it several times, trying to know, well, what is in here, Lord? What is this all about? And, you know, the book of Zechariah is, is difficult to begin with. There's a lot of parables and a lot of um, hidden meanings and poetry and a lot of wild prophecies, kind of wild scenery going on. Women, car- women being, a woman being thrown into a basket and being carried by women with uh, wings and over to the land of Sinar and some other chapters that we've seen. And so this chapter also has some very difficult parts. So as I was reading through it, um, I wasn't sure what it was all about. And so I looked at a bunch of commentaries and that did not make it any easier. <laughs> so in some ways, uh, there, were, there were different differences of opinion, 40 different opinions on some portions of it. Uh, but I think we will have something here that will bring some hope to our lives out of God's word. And most importantly, it is not so much, the, although prophetic is important and the meaning is important, but what does it mean to us? And so hopefully we'll be able to get some, some nuggets out of it for ourselves to be able to take home that will draw us closer to God. So starting in verse 1, Open your doors, O Lebanon, that fire may devour your cedars. Wail, O Cyprus, for the cedar has fallen. Because the mighty trees are ruined, wail, O oaks of Bashan, for the thick forest has come down. There is the sound of wailing shepherds, for the, their glory is in ruins. There is the sound of roaring lions, for the pride of Jordan is in ruins. Right? So maybe you can see off, off the bat. This is what on earth are they talking about here, right? Trees crying, cypress trees crying for cedars that have fallen, you know. And, and uh, doors being opened in Lebanon so that fire can burn it up. And Jordan, the lions in Jordan, uh, the pride of Jordan is in ruins. What on earth is he talking about here? Now, now it's not, uh, we can't, you know, because where they put the chapter divisions is not biblical. We don't necessarily know where, where, Jack, uh, where Zechariah would have ended and begun. This very well could be part of chapter 10. Char- part of chapter 10 was, gave us um, Israel's restoration and and judgment upon the surrounding nations. And so here it's mentioning Lebanon and Jordan, so very well could be judgment that would come upon them, just as it would come upon Assyria and Egypt, mentioned in chapter 10. And, and so that's a, a very real possibility. Um, and it mentions all these trees, and down in Jordan, there, along the Jordan River, it used to be very forested. Uh, we have the story in, in the Bible of uh, King David's son, Absalom, um, running away after David uh, comes back into the city and he goes down towards the Jordan River and he's riding on a horse and his hair gets caught in the thicket of tree branches and he gets hung up there and uh, Abner, I think it was, goes and and kills him. Well, you go down to the Jordan River today and on our trips, and we're having another one scheduled for the spring, uh, we go from the Dead Sea all the way up to the Sea of Galilee and even beyond that, but but that stretch, uh, there's no trees. There's no trees there at all, hardly at all. Um, where again, one time it must have been very lush with trees. And so today, so here it's describing, uh, and lions, lions used to hide in those trees in that area and the bushes there. And today there's no lions in Israel anymore. Right? David uh, or Samson uh, killed a lion right with his bare hands. Um, David killed a lion. And so today there's no lions. It's mentioning the lions here and they're, they're crying out. Well, they are no more. So it could be describing that the devastation and deforestation that took place, as well as what happened to the nations over them. Then in verse 4, it picks up, Thus says the Lord my God. So here's kind of like a start, right? Here's a kind of a division point. This might have been the place to start the chapter. Thus saith the Lord. Right? So thus saith the Lord my God, Feed the flock for slaughter, whose owners slaughter them and feel no guilt. Those who sell them say, Blessed be the Lord, for I am rich, and their shepherds do not pity them. For I will no longer pity the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord. But indeed, I will give everyone into his neighbor's hand and into the hand of his king, and they shall attack the land, and I will not deliver them from their land. And so, talking about destruction, and in that first few verses, if that applied to this chapter, it was talking about destruction and trees crying and the doors opening, cedars opening and for fire. Um, And so, here, it, it doesn't specifically mention who these shepherds are and, and, or, or these owners that are feeding the flock for slaughter. Um, 
and what exactly is taking place, but it could very well be the Lord God saying, feed the flock, right? And so that's good, but feed them for slaughter. He knows what's going to happen. And so he's foreseeing what's going to happen, but they're being fed anyway, but slaughter is going to come. And these owners that are managing over the flock, the, the under shepherds, they're not treating it well. They're just in it for gain. They're just in it for money. They're just, oh, we got rich off the animals. Off the, we didn't care. We didn't treat them well. It didn't matter. Just rush them in. Just pile them in there as, as much as can be, as long as we're getting rich off of it. Well, Zechariah, we see through the book of Zechariah, a lot of his prophecies had to do with last day events, as well as a lot of his prophecies had to do with the time of Yeshua. We saw in, what was it, chapter 9, I believe it was, where Yeshua is coming over Mount of Olives, lowly, as a lowly king or humble king, riding on a donkey. And we'll see in this chapter also, an illustration that puts us right into Yeshua's day. And so the prophecies could be for Yeshua's time, prophetically, from Zechariah's time to Yeshua's time, but also prophetically for last day events. And we do see some parallels there. Those cedar doors could be in, reminiscent of the cedar doors of the temple that burned down. And so that could be what was being opened and and crying for the destruction that took place, the trees representing God's people who died in the slaughter of the Roman destruction. That very well could be what I was talking about. And, and here are these, these leaders who don't really care about the people, selling the leadership, selling the, 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 the priesthood, the Kohenim seats, the Kohenim Gadol, buying it from the Romans and, and the Roman leaders and governors, pushing for their positions, not caring about the people, not concerned about the people, whatever it would take to get gain for themselves. And as long as they become rich, that's all they care about, having no pity on the people. And certainly today we see that. We see major, major companies, big companies. All they're concerned with is their bottom line. They really don't care about the customers. There's hardly any customer service anymore. And as long as they're just, you know, raking in the bucks, they don't care about their employees. They're today, gone tomorrow. No more gold watch when you retire. Forget about that. That's long gone. Uh, stayed in one company for 40 years, that's long gone. They, they just use us and dump us and, and move us on. And very descriptive of this time. The, the hearts of many are waxing cold, no caring. And we have these monopolies now really controlling bigger portions of the world. I mean, not just national com companies, but worldwide companies that came up overnight, came up within the last 10 years, weren't there 10 years ago, and now richest people in the world. Unbelievable. And so they're taking advantage of the people while the people are being fed styrofoam, for I will no longer pity the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord. But indeed, I will give everyone into his neighbor's hand and into the hand of his king. They shall attack the land, and I will not deliver them from their hand. Well, that doesn't sound like the Lord, right? That doesn't sound like the Lord God. Where's our God who's delivering us? Where's the Lord who cares, who never leaves us nor forsakes us? Well, we see throughout the Bible, there are times where God steps back and he lets things run their course. He lets us make our choices. He gives us free choice. And while he's there and seeing it, the calamities happening, he's crying. It's breaking his heart. He hates to see it. But he has basically tied his hands in giving us the wonderful gift of free choice. Now, this the stupid saying, uh, is God so powerful that he can make a rock that's so big that he himself can't lift it? You know, right? What a stupid question. <laughs> and of course he could, but of course he wouldn't be stupid enough to do so. But in a sense, he has done so because he is the one who's created free choice. And free choice is a rock so big that he himself can't lift it. He has given us that privilege to make those choices for Adam and Eve to reject them if they if, to reject him if they wanted to, for Lucifer and one third of the angels to reject him if they wanted to, really for all of them, but one third of them made that wrong choice. And he hadn't stopped it. I mean, he kicked them out of heaven, he kicked them out of the Garden of Eden, but he let them make their choice. He didn't knock. Lucifer out, you know, he didn't kill Lucifer right from the start. He didn't jump in between Adam and Eve or between Eve and the serpent. He let her make her choice. He let them die. He let them bear the consequences of their choices. He let Cain kill Abel. 
He let Nebuchadnezzar come in and destroy Jerusalem. He let Rome come in and destroy Jerusalem. And in our day too, he steps back and he allows things to happen if that's what is desired by the people. Of course, not everybody, right? Abel didn't want it. Not everyone, Daniel and his friends didn't want the destruction. They were following God. They were faithful people when Rome came in and destroyed it. But the majority were moving along that way and God let the majority rule and for judgment to then fall. And I think that's what's going on in this chapter. And I think that's an important lesson for us to learn that while we're suffering here and God is sometimes allowing it to happen, we're not alone. He's still there. He's still over it all. He did forgive Adam and Eve. Abel's blood did cry out from the grave, from the ground. He did bring us back from Babylon. He has kept a remnant after Rome, and he has brought us back again. And even after these last day calamities, heaven is just around the corner. Verse 7, so I fed the flock for slaughter, in particular the poor of the flock, I took for myself two staffs, the one I called beauty and the other I called bonds, and I fed the flock. So again, the good shepherd, he's feeding the flock and concerned especially for the poor in heart, poor in spirit, those who are humble, those who sense their need, those who cry out to the Lord for help. And he's got his two staffs. Shepherds would often have two staffs. One for with a hook on it to pull the sheep in, keep them away from the weeds, tap them on the side lightly to get them going in the right direction. And another one for beating a wolf or protecting a sheep. So he's got these two staffs, one beauty, one bonds. And I dismissed the three shepherds in one month my soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. Now, Jeremiah doesn't tell us who these shepherds are or what this one month is. And again, lots of different opinions on it. I kind of think in context, it's talking about the, the shepherds, the leaders that were supposed to shepherd God's people. And as we look at everything in the Bible, having a reflection on Yeshua, Yeshua the good shepherd, and what type of good shepherd is he? What is the Messiah? Messiah, Mashiach, the anointed one. Three different anointings. We have the anointing of the prophets. And Yeshua came as a prophet, suffering servant in human flesh. He is right now serving as our Kohen Gadol in the priesthood, in the heavenly temple. And he'll come again as judge in that Kohen role. And then again, the third aspect, as king, the anointed one as king. So we have three aspects here in the time of Yeshua that we're not following the Lord. We're not serving the people faithfully. We're evil shepherds who abhorred the Lord. We have the king or the governor. We have the Kohen Gadol, Caiaphas. We have Caiaphas, we have Pilate. And we have false prophets. And the Lord dismissed them soon after Yeshua's, Yeshua's death and resurrection. A few years, a few decades after that, there is no governors over Israel. There is no more Israel. There is no more Jerusalem. There is no more temple. There is no more priesthood. And the false prophets were dealt with. I think that's what he's referring to here. And he dismissed them, dismissed them in one month. Now, one month, if it's a prophetic month of 30 days, 30 years, could be referring to Yeshua's life. He starts his ministry at about the age of 30. So it could be within that time of his life. It's not exact 30, so maybe not. Not quite 30 years from his death and burial and resurrection to the destruction of Jerusalem. Closed, but not quite, so might not be the application. It's hard to know. Verse 9, And I said, I will, not, I will not feed you. Let what is dying die, 
and what is perishing perish. Let those that are left eat each other's flesh. And again, we see destruction in Jerusalem by Rome, siege outside, destruction taking place inside, famines, and we read of other sieges and other famines that took place in Jerusalem and other cities where people did eat, eat each other, eat their children, horrendous things taking place, and God again having to pull back. God having to allow things to run their course because of our choices, or at least the choices of the majority, and, and the minority, the faithful ones, suffer with them. Right? Elijah experienced three and a half years of famine with everybody else, with, with, with no rain, with everybody else. I'm sitting by the brook, getting fed by a raven, having to go to a widow and get fed there. He suffered with everyone else. God's people suffer as God suffers, even as the wicked make their choices. And again, here in these last days, people are not literally eating each other, but just about. Praying on each other, the Holy Spirit is being withdrawn, People's hearts are failing them for fear. People are turning on each other. Madness is taking place. Things that we wouldn't have imagined even three years ago. That no one would think would ever take place, would ever be allowed, would not be condemned. It's not only being taken place now, but being promoted as righteous, as good, as right, as just. Right is wrong and wrong is right. God will let this earth perish. I took my staff beauty, I cut it in two that I might break the covenant which I had made with all the peoples. So it was broken on that day, thus the poor of the flock who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. So he takes the one staff called beauty, breaks it in half, and this breaking of a covenant. It could be, again, the covenant for, with Jerusalem, that God promised Jerusalem. He would watch over it. As David prayed, Lord, if, my, if I forget Jerusalem, may my right hand lose its cunning. Not promising as the apple of his eye, he would watch over it, and yet he let it be destroyed. Let the temple be destroyed, at least for a time. Today, Jerusalem is rebuilt. Not a temple, but the city and the country is rebuilt. God's eyes are still upon his people, always have been, even as he pulls back for a time. His everlasting covenant still remains, even if broken for a time. And it's not so much him, that he that breaks the covenant. If we break our covenant with him, our commitment to him, then his side gets broken as well. Gives us again that free choice. I said to them, if it is agreeable to you, give me my wages. And if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. Now this text we kind of gives us an anchor of in history of where this takes place, where he's prophesying for. And I guess before I get into this, another thing on that covenant for last days. God made a covenant with this world that he would not destroy the earth with water again, right? He gave the, the rainbow as a covenant. But in a sense he's going to break that covenant, it's not going to be destroyed with water, but it will be destroyed with fire. So this earth will be destroyed, and all the inhabitants in it will. But again, because of what our choices are, and what we've desired. So back to this text. Very distinct words here. For my wages, they weighed out for my wages, so for my actions, for my work that I will do, I will weigh out 30 pieces of silver to be paid. Zechariah 11, 13, And the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, that princely price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. 
So wages for a deed done, 30 pieces of silver is the wages. Those wages, those 30 pieces of silver will be thrown down and it's a princely price and it'll be thrown down for the potter. It's like five different points there. This princely price. Now this 30 pieces of silver is also mentioned in the book of Exodus that if your ox goes and kills a neighbor's servant, you have to pay your neighbor 30 pieces of silver, which might have been considered a high price for a servant, but God's showing that the servant is valuable as well and as a deterrent and as a punishment. But as far as a princely prize, 30 pieces of silver is not much for a prince. But he refers to it here as a princely prize, yet it's the price for a servant. So a prince, that's a servant. And we see the fulfillment in the book of Matthew. Chapter 26, verse 14. One of the twelve, Judas Iscariot, went to the chief Kohen and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? What are you willing to pay me? What will my wages be? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. And from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. So he's asking for wages. They decide on 30 pieces of silver for this servant. Betray this servant. They didn't recognize him as a prince. This servant, I'll give you 30 pieces of silver if you can gore him. If you can kill him, we'll give you 30 pieces of silver. You can deliver him over us so that we can kill him. We'll give you 30 pieces of silver. Judas then sought opportunity to betray him. This takes place right after the time where um, the, the account where um, Yeshua goes and has dinner at Mary's house, Mary and Martha and Lazarus's house. And Mary pours the perfume, breaks the perfume, whether accidentally or whatever, breaks it open, pours the perfume on Yeshua's feet. And Judas is not happy about that. And money could have been used to put into the treasury for the poor as if he cared about the poor. But he thought it was a waste. If Yeshua knew what kind of woman this was, he lost his respect for Yeshua. And right away he goes, right after that he goes and works this deal with the Kohen Gadol, one of the shepherds who's not shepherding the people. And then there's the Passover. And at the Passover, Yeshua washes the disciples' feet, including Judas's feet, demonstrating love and forgiveness towards Judas. And as they're eating together, and Yeshua is sitting, leaning on Judas, Yeshua says, one of you will betray me. And they all say, is it I? And Yeshua gives a a hint of who it's going to be. He who takes the matzah, he who takes the matzah and dips it in the haroset. And eats together with me. He is the one who will betray me. And again, Judas sitting next to him, be the one to dip together with him in the same bowl, the horseradish and the haroset. And then almost immediately after that, Yeshua tells Judas to go, whatever you, what you need to do, go do quickly. And he gets up and he leaves the Seder. Now the other disciples are able to figure it out. Pretty dense crowd, I guess. But they think he's going to go buy something for the Passover. And Judas goes and sets up the betrayal. Yeshua prays with disciples that we all might be one as he and the Father are one, and that we might be one with him, and we might be one with the Father, and that we might be one with each other. They sing the Hallel together. They close out the Passover, and they go down across the Kidron Valley from the city of Jerusalem, from the upper room, down the Kidron Valley to the other side, to the Mount of Olives. The base of the Mount of Olives, where the garden, where the where the olive press would be. 
down to the garden of the pressing. In Gethsemane. And Yeshua is down there praying, taking the sins of the world upon himself. And Judas with a mob meets him there. And Yeshua calls him friend. Judas goes up to him and kisses him, and betrays him with a kiss, kiss of death. Yeshua says, who do you seek? And they say, well, you seek Yeshua. He says, I am. And they all fall back. It's glory revealed in a flash, and they fall down. They get back up, and they arrest him. And here again, we see Yeshua step back and allow them to take him. We see the Father allow them to take him, feeding the flock for slaughter, not feeding them anymore, stepping back. Yeshua is taken and he's dragged from Pilate's hall to Caiaphas, back to Pilate. And I think Herod's in the mix there too. And then he's taken, beaten, bag put on his head or cloth put on his head, beaten, If you're a prophet, who's beating you? Tell us who it is. Put a robe on him, mock him, deride him. Take some briars, thick, long thorns, braid a crown and press it into his head. Begin beating him around the head, to press it in even more. Take him out, have him whipped. Not just with whips, but with whips, with barbs on the end, with bones on the end, with glass on the end, grabbing a hold of the skin and ripping it out, lacerating and then ripping. Spitting on him, taunting him making him carry his own wood, dragging through the streets, up and down the hills of Jerusalem, on the hard stone pavement, taken to the hill, Calvary's hill. All the disciples had fled. They'd fled when he was in the garden in the mob came, some gathered at the trial, but always at a distance. And even as he's being killed, they're off in a distance. He's all alone, bearing our sins, bearing your sin, bearing my sin. So much so that the Father steps back again, so much so that Yeshua doesn't even see him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But God was there. Yeshua just couldn't see him. There's times in our life where Yeshua has had to step back and he doesn't seem to be there. And horrible things are happening. But he's still there. And it's not over yet. And he cries out, it is finished. And he dies. Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful, not repentant, but remorseful, and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief Kohen and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and went and hanged himself. And the chief Kohen said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. And they bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. 
Exactly like the prophecy said. How much will you pay me? What will my wages be? 30 pieces of silver. He takes the 30 pieces of silver. He throws them down, as the prophecy said, it would be thrown down for the potter. Every aspect fulfilled in Judas's life. In Yeshua's life. And no doubt at the end of time, there'll be Judas's as well. Verse 14, back to Zechariah chapter 11, verse 14. I cut in two my other staff bonds that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. This is the first time in the chapter it mentions Israel at all or Judah at all. And it only mentions them as being a, this bond between them being broken. Now they had separated after the time of Solomon under Rehoboam. And then years later, the Assyrians come and take northern Israel captive, disperse them through the Assyrian kingdom. And then later on, Babylon comes and takes Judah captive and destroys Jerusalem and the temple. But then after the 70 years prophesied by Jeremiah, God brings us back to the time of Zechariah. And both come together. People from Judah and people from the ten tribes of Israel. All twelve tribes come back together. Really thirteen tribes. And you count the Kohens, or Levites rather. And we see them, right? We have Judas. And he's from the tribe of Judah. But it's Judah, Judah Iscariot. So maybe he's from the tribe of Issachar. It's Judah, Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Maybe he was from the tribe of Simeon. Or maybe there was an intermarriaging going on from the time of Zechariah till Yeshua's day and families took all little bit of the names of each one of the tribes that they were a mix of. We have Paul who says he was of the tribe of Benjamin. We have Anna in the temple at Yeshua's birth or right after Yeshua's birth when they brought him for his Brit Malah for his circumcision, that she was of the tribe of Asher. And we have Yeshua of the tribe of Judah. And so we have various different tribes mentioned that they did come back together. But then it's saying here that that bond is going to be broken. A unity is going to be broken. And at the time of Rome coming in and destroying Jerusalem, there was many, many factions, Pharisees, Sadducees, Zealots, the believers, and many others, groups vying and disagreeing with each other. And as Rome tightened the screws and there was lots of division on how we should respond to this, how we should react, what should we do? You have the Essenes, the Essenes as well, many groups. The vision took place. There was no unity on what action to take, how to respond. And then the temple was destroyed and the city was destroyed and dispersed throughout the nations. Bond broken. Separation. And now today, many divisions within Judaism, among them different denominations, different groups. Even in Orthodox, many different groups. And then you also have the Sephardic and the Ashkenazis, lots of different groups, the bond broken. But also in this last days, God's people were fragmented and broken. There's very little unity. And the attempts at unity are a unity with compromise. A unity forsaking the truth. A unity on falsehoods. A corrupt unity. Bonds are broken. No, experiencing the oneness that Yeshua prayed for us to have. Yeshua said and prophesied that 
children would betray their parents and parents would betray their children and sister and sister and brother against brother. Bond broken. Familial ties broken. We're living in that age. We're living in that day. Families are being broken up over who they vote for. Craziness. Sides being taken. Lines drawn. Civil war is taking place right out on the streets. And I believe it's only going to get worse. <laughs> We're living in these last days. And these are just the birth pains. And it'll seem like God has stepped back. Where are you, Lord? Where is your promise? Where is our hope? Where is your deliverance? But God has not forgotten us. The Lord said to me, next, take for yourself the implement of a foolish shepherd. For indeed, I will rise up a shepherd in the land who will not care for those who are cut off, nor seek the young, nor heal those that are broken, nor feed those that stand still. But he will eat the flesh of the fat and tear their hooves in pieces. So a false shepherd, and if this timeline is moving along, then after the destruction of Jerusalem, not long thereafter, about 100 A.D., a little after that, well, we had destruction of Jerusalem in 70, and then 135 A.D., Rome came in again and demolished even more and killed even more and took even more captive, a remnant that was left. So in about 100 years after Yeshua, after his death and burial and resurrection, compromises began to take place within the body of believers. They began forsaking his law, with a rejection of the Jewish people. We can see we have some of the writings. Rejection of his truth. Rejection of his covenant. Rejection of his laws. We have anti-Semitism and antinomianism. Rejection of God's laws. And a false shepherd, a foolish shepherd coming in, bringing compromise into the faith, uniting paganism with the Bible, and continuing for the last 1,900 years. Even to the brazen point where for hundreds of years, the professed shepherds of God's word, banning God's word, outlawing God's word, outlawing the reading of God's word, outlawing the following of God's word. How long in keeping Shabbat? Terrorizing and killing and massacring those who continue to do so. And through those dark times, the dark ages as it's referred to, very dark time. Without the Bible, there is no light. And again, it seemed like God stepped back. He allowed it to take place. But a remnant remained. God's light was still shining in corners of the world. There were Jewish settlements that have survived. We've survived to this time. That's an absolute miracle. The Bible has survived. True believers survived and kept the light alive, sometimes in mountains and caves. Small remnants, but God kept it alive. And that's how it'll be. That's how it's always been. From Noah's day to our day, that's how it will be. And so even while God seems to not be feeding the sheep and watching over the sheep and allows false shepherds and foolish shepherds to come in and slaughter the people, don't be disheartened, even amidst the darkness. That's why it's faith. We believe by faith, not by sight. Not by seeing God always at work. It's believing by faith that God is at work in spite of what we see, in spite of what's going on around us, 
while the forests are burning, while the city is being destroyed, while people are feeding on each other, while bonds are broken, while destruction is taking place. Believing that God is bigger than it all and will have the last say. And this anti-Messiah, who is already at work in John's day and is still at work in our day and will continue to work more and more so. Leading astray. Fostering confusion. Bringing about false unity. And all the world wandering after. But he doesn't care for those that are cut off. Any more than the political leaders of this world care about the people of this world. Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. A sword shall be against his arm and against his right eye. His arm shall completely wither and his right eye shall be totally blind. As in Daniel chapter 2, which prophecies all the way to the end of time, a stone comes cut out of the mountain without hands and destroys the statue and all the kingdoms of this world and sets up an everlasting kingdom. As in Daniel chapter 7, the anti-Messiah power comes and it, he is broken, his horn, the little horn is broken and destroyed, and trampled. The same in Revelation 13. God will deal with the anti-Messiah power. He will deal with it once and for all. He will have his sword. His sword, his word, will rise up and will break the arm, will wither the arm. The strength of the anti-Messiah power, the world powers, will wither it all will blind its right eye, its ability to see, its plans, its goals. It will destroy it once and for all, and it will not be any longer. God will have the last say. Hold fast unto the Lord. Brace yourself. Stand fast. Grow your faith. Believe in the Lord. Endure to the end, because God wins. This is where this chapter ends, but it's not where the book ends. We still have a chapter 12 and 13 and 14 where God enters in and brings in his everlasting, eternal life. So we will follow it through and we will continue on other weeks. But even out of this dismal chapter... <laughs> of forest burning and false and horrible shepherds and even when God is not able to feed the sheep and doesn't feed the sheep and lets us go to slaughter. He himself betrayed. Oh, and this anti-Messiah power, this false shepherd parallels. That's why Judas is brought out here, the 30 pieces of silver, is a parallel there. Who was Judas? What was Judas a part of? What club was he a part of? Was he part of the Essenes? Was he part of the Sadducees? Was he part of the Pharisees? Was he part of the Romans? Whose team was he on? Where did he sit? He was among the disciples. He was one of the professed believers. He sat at the table, at the Seder. He sat next to Yeshua. He ate with him, he dipped with him in the same bowl. He had his feet washed by Yeshua. And the same with the anti-Messiah power. It doesn't come from outside, it's from within. The corruption from within, the compromise from within, the deceit from within, the betrayal from within, the selling out for money from within. The taking of the prince and goring him. The prince who was a shepherd, who was a servant rather, washing again the disciples' feet. But who is betrayed with a kiss. Comes in sweetly, comes in as a friend. 
point. He's a false and foolish shepherd. He's not an anti-Messiah as in against Messiah. He's anti-Messiah as in counterfeit. Replacement for. Not condemning, not railing against, not blaspheming outwardly, but kissing, betraying, blaspheming in the sense of kissing the one you're killing one you're betraying, the one you're turning over, using a kiss as a sign for the mob to grab. And while he's kissing sweetly with his words, the foolish shepherd is ravishing the flock with falsehood and deception and lies. It's anti-Semitism and antinomianism, denying God's word, denying his full, full truth, while professing a unity over the flock and a pulling together. But the wages is compromise. The price is compromise of truth. And God steps back and he will allow it to happen. He will allow all the world to wander after the beast. He will allow God's remnant to be threatened with not being able to buy nor sell. He will allow God's remnant to be persecuted and tried and to be hunted, to be killed, to be martyrs, to be chased into the mountains and the hills and the woods, to be thrown into prisons and dungeons, to be beaten. But if the Father allowed that to happen to Yeshua, if Yeshua allowed that to happen to himself, if he allowed it to happen to his disciples, we can praise the Lord that he has counted us worthy to suffer persecution for his sake. So brace yourself, because the time is coming. And as we saw last week, all ten virgins are sleeping. Those that are waiting on his coming are sleeping. And only five had the extra oil. Now is the time to be storing up the extra oil. Now is the time to be praying for that latter rain power. Now is the time to be being filled with God's spirit so that we have the grace to endure to the end. As we pray together in a moment, Whatever area applies to you, maybe you're one of those trees, maybe you're a cedar, maybe you're an oak, maybe you're strong, maybe you're just a bush, whatever, being cut down, and maybe there's a wailing going on and a trial going on and a heartache going on in your life. Or it seems like the doors are being busted open and broken down. Maybe you feel like you're not being fed by the good shepherd, like he's turned his back, that he's forsaken you, he's turned you over to the the wolves of this world. I mean, it feels like the bond between you and him is broken. Maybe there's relationship bonds in your life that have been broken, friendships, family ties. Maybe it feels like the beauty has been broken, the glory of God, the joy of the Lord. In spite of it all, believe not by feelings, believe not by sight, not by outward circumstances, but believe the word of God. God will crush all the nations of the world. God will wither the right hand of the enemy. He will blind the enemy. He will come on his horse with all of his angels and his deliverance will come. And he will create a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And so as we pray, whatever part applies to you, whether you're going through a hard time, or maybe like Judas, maybe you've been selling out the Lord, maybe you've been denying him in your actions, maybe you've been denying him in your life, maybe you've been denying him by not speaking for him, maybe you've been hiding him in your heart, maybe you've been committing some sin that you know you shouldn't, a known sin, 
rebelliously held on to. You want God to cleanse you through his blood, through his sacrifice, through his grace. Bring you restoration and healing. And as he restored Jerusalem after Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, and then restored it again after Rome, he will restore your life. He will restore your faith. He'll restore the bond between you and him. Let him do his work in you and through you. Let him have his way. Let us pray together. Our Lord and our God, King of the universe, we're thankful, Lord, even on this dark, forsaken planet, your grace is still here. There are still flowers on the thorn bushes. There's still fruit on the briars. There are still birds and clouds and sun in the concrete jungles. Thank you that your presence is still here in the midst of it all. Thank you that you've never forsaken us and you never will. Give us faith to see through the dark times in our life right now. Give us faith to see through the dark time that's going to cover the entire earth as the whole earth was enshrouded in darkness at your death. Give us faith to see through the darkness and to see your face. In Yeshua's holy name.